so virtual HTML. What is it, and why do we need it to help us to create a general artificial intelligence? So one thing you'd need in this, the example that I gave previously about um, making something that's sort of like Google. Um, only instead of searching for information, you're sort of searching for a software solution to a certain problem that you have. Um, you need some way to deliver this uh, piece of software. And you have to have some sort of unified um, software stack underneath. Uh, in order to make this happen. Um, okay. So, virtual HTML. <clears throat> so, one of the the biggest problems in software development is programmers spending their time writing code and solving problems that other programmers have already written and solved. And it's not just like going to Stack Overflow and copying and pasting someone's code that I mean you're going to GitHub and taking someone's code. What I mean is that you, one programmer will sit down and they will solve all of these problems and they will write the code for how to solve it. And then they'll publish this code. And then another programmer, now that we know that this thing, this one programmer did is possible, well now another programmer is tasked to uh, solve it as well so that they can use it for some other purpose. But instead of just using their code, they, they have to still go through the same steps that that programmer did and solve all the same problems. Okay, so what's an example of this? <clears throat> so the best example of this is the uh, model view controller um, programming model. And so In the model view controller model, I guess, um, this gives you a layer of, of abstraction so that you can um, uh, so when you're programming, um, you, you always have these similar kind of problems. You have, you have to have some way to model the data, you have to have some way to um, control how that data is uh, saved um, and loaded to the controller and you have to have some way to display it and view it. And so um, and so say I'm programming my application and I have to use a model view controller. And what I want to do is I want to make an application that um, uh, let's just say has a user sign up on it, and so I have to make a um, a uh, a model for the the users, and I have to make the view for the the sign up form and the login form. I have to make the controller to handle all of the 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 login logic. And <clears throat> or if I was making a, a a task list task list app, I have to make a a model that says this is the how to represent the data for an individual task, and so we represent the data for a list of tasks, and we can make a view. This is how we view the task on the screen. We have to make the controller. This is how we 
take the user's input and save it and, and so on and so forth. But if I was to actually be hired today to make an application, say a taskless application, which has already been done, I have to go through all of these steps. I have to build up my programming environment. I have to, um, right, I need to get Visual Studio. I got to uh, get whatever extensions and everything else that I need. I've got to, um, uh, so then once I have my programming environment, then I have to um, don't even get to build on top of previous programmers work of model view controller I have to go and recreate that myself now there's definitely a library or something I'm going to be calling to do that but I still have to go through the work of okay well of thinking in in that structure of okay well I have to think about how do I get the data and how do I store it in the database and how do I organize it okay so the my task, what do I call my, I have to think about my, in my task list application, okay, what am I going to call my, my task list database, what am I going to call my, uh, the tables in the database, what am I going, and I have to think about all of these things, I have to think about, um, once I get out of the database, I have to think about, um, Like how do I display it on the screen nicely? How do I make sure that they, they don't put in too much text? How do I make sure, and like all of these problems, like they've already been solved, but I have to solve them again to do any programming task. So anytime you hire a programmer to do a job, they don't get to exploit science. They have to, where you get to build on top of other people's stuff. They have to recreate everything that's been done before. And This is extremely frustrating trying to start any software project at all because you have to have this sort of foundational bit of code and then and so maybe maybe you can find some other uh, I mean, like the meteor framework or some uh, framework like that to start with. But even those frameworks, you still have to think in this model view controller, and you still have to think about how am I going to get my data, and keep it separated from the view, and and, and it's like just not quite abstract enough. So and so how we can solve this is by abstracting the model view controller business away so that we don't even have to see it again. And so that's what virtual HTML can do at the core technical level. And then at the higher level, once you're able to build with it, you can make it so that um, If I want to get started on a, my own programming project, or I want to help on someone else's programming project, then it, it's not a big deal to be able to, to get started. Because um, all the code is already there and ready for you at your fingertips. So, So how do we do that? So 
what is a virtual HTML document? So, the reason it's called virtual is because the way we currently think about HTML is that it's it's they're static files. Like if I load up um, YouTube.com, it serves me um, this HTML file, which I then download to my disk, and then if I load, I load from the disk and it shows me the YouTube page. Um, and so, and so that file itself, then it might load in other parts of the page, right? It, and but it's a very confusing it's a very confusing programming model when you're dealing with the web because HTML is sometimes it's like the delivery mechanism, like it's when you load the page, that's what comes through, and sometimes it's used for templating and all these other things. Um, I feel like I'm not making sense. Um, okay. So. So. If we imagine a typical like sort of um, web app, the HTML is just used as a means to an end. It's not like when you go to the YouTube.com, there isn't an actual HTML page on YouTube that displays what you're seeing. Right, it's sort of the HTML is just used to deliver you on the back end. They take and they assemble a bunch of stuff, and then they they deliver you part of the page, and then the page will then go out and fetch out more stuff and build out the page into the final the final form that it is. And and, and when you're working on on projects like these, it's very confusing to work on. Because some parts you have to go in and it's like a front end thing, so you have to go into the front end JavaScript to change it. But then other things, it's like, well, that's actually in the, um, the code that generates the JavaScript for the front end. <laughs> and so you have to go and modify that code. And then you get into all kinds of confusing uh, patterns. Um, which haven't really been abstracted away very usefully. Um, things are maybe you're loading JSON and then parsing it into HTML, and you're loading HTML templates from the server. Uh, and it can, it, but then also that HTML that's loading that from the server is also been a hodgepodge generated from the server. And yeah, it's very confusing to work on. So with a virtual HTML document, all that goes away. So it's a virtual document because um, when you create the document, it always just is. So. If I created a my document.html and 
I load that up on my web page and it has a text box in it and I type in some text in that text box then the next time I open up that HTML file the text will still be in the text box whereas currently today that wouldn't be the case when you loaded that page up again the text would be gone if you wanted to have that feature you'd have to go and program it in and um, from the sort of basic um, idea of just remembering what is in the text box um, you can just sort of remember everything else about the page whatever modifications whatever um, changes the person makes to the page um, and you just remember them so if you go back to this to the text box example um, Right, so if we were doing this in a traditional web app sense and we wanted to just have a text box that you could type something in and it would remember what was in the text box, well, you'd have to go to the database. You'd create a database, you'd have to create a table in the database and uh, say it's going to save this text box data. We have to write code that interacts with the database. So even if we're using a, a framework, we still have to do the work of following the, the tutorial of, um, okay, now I have to copy and paste this code into here, and then I have to take these keys from over here, and then I get to go into the database, and now we're connected to the database, and then I have to go and um, uh, write my model code, even if I'm using a generator to do that, I still have to tell it to do that, to generate it for this very specific text box, then I have to... Um, uh, write the view code which would just generate the HTML then I have to go in and use a JavaScript framework and then we'll write some code to um, uh, the text when I'm typing the text box and then take the text and send it back to the server and then we have to write code on the server to deal with that um, and maybe after a couple of days you can have uh, something working but with virtual html what, what would happen is you just create your html document and you have your text box in it and then whatever you type in the text box is just saved in that virtual html document now the problem with that is that um, um well, i guess in terms of, of implementing that we could we're abstract, we end up abstracting the model view controllers, we don't have to deal with it ever again. Or databases, because we're just like, okay, this is HTML document, and then we have this text box. And then if you want to create another document, because you want to save more than just that one bit of text, we just go to the URL bar, and then you add a, an ID to it, right? And then it will virtually generate a new page based off of the template that you gave it and then it can generate all the code that you need to update the page and save everything in the text box and so making it start figure out how to do with text blocks and even branch up to the other form elements and then other um, um, interactive aspects of the page that you might want to have have saved um, and then you can do all kinds of cool stuff so like you have uh, like I said, you go to the URL bar, you add a unique ID, and then you can create multiple copies of this document. Um, you can change the URL, say like slash list or whatever, and now it will can just automatically take all of those um, documents and display them on one page for you, and you get your list view program. 
Um, And I actually wrote code to do this. And it got it to work. It's really cool. Um, but then I ran into a problem where I'd written enough code that I couldn't keep all the code in my head at once and so I was trying to add other features and 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 do other things I had to go back and remember how this this code worked and you might say like oh well you should just commented your code and documented it properly, but the reality is when you're in there, in the code, however many comments you put in aren't going to help you because you still have to understand what the code is actually doing to modify it and to work with it. Um, and so you have to be able to load it back up into your head again. Um, and... My frustration was that well, it's already loaded up in, inside the computer, <laughs> like, and I just need to see like what does this variable look like, what's the what is it equal at this specific time, and just like the, and then I remember how this little bit of the code works, so I could add part to it or hack it to make it work in a different way, um, and so I'm trying to use the debugging tools. To do this, but the debugging tools just don't quite give me the information that I want. And I was like, okay, well, that's fine. I'm using um, Google Chrome, and Google Chrome is open source, and so the debugger that they have built into it is open source as well. So that's fine, I'll just download the code and I'll look through it and I'll modify it to, to give me the information that I want. And <laughs> the debugging code for the debugger, what I mean, like the when you press like F12 or go to inspect element, that that debugger in Chrome. Um, the way that it's programmed is like is basically like a traditional web app where you have an HTML front end and then you have a a server back end, um, and so like that the F12 window you open is just a browser window that's loading, um, <laughs> loading HTML, but the whole interface is built in HTML, and um, but that's all front end code, and then there's which is all written in HTML and JavaScript. And then the back end code for it is written in C. It's not written in like Node.js or something like that. It's written in C because, of course, that's what uh, Chrome is written in. That's what the V8 JavaScript engine and the DOM engine is all written in. So if you have a debugger, then that, you're going to be hooking into there. So it's, it's all going to be written in C. Okay, well, that's fine. I don't mind learning learning C++, so um, and then we reach another point of frustration that I kind of mentioned earlier. So now, um, before I could, like I downloaded the code for the front end of the debugger and I looked through all of that code and, and realized that the information that I need wasn't available there and then I needed to modify the back end code to get it. And it's in C++, but now I've got to go and uh, uh, get Visual Studio set up with all the right C++ 
um, extensions. I've got to go to GitHub, download their um, the code from Google Chrome. I've got to get it working in Visual Studio and not just working once, but like working twice because like the way with software development, you always have like one like version you make which is like a debug version that you work on, and then there's another version you make, which is the, the proper version that you send out. And so I got to set up that kind of stuff in my system, and then uh, get the compilers all working, and then um, go and make sure that I can uh, go in my code editor, and I make a change, and I can compile the code, and it actually um, updates in my system, and 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 to do and so <laughs> that would have to be another version of Chrome that's running. So I gotta run multiple instances of it together. And so it just ends up being this like just to get the environment set up to be able to make this change is so frustrating when there's already like there's already people that work on this code. They already have all of this set up and sure they have like tutorials and maybe little tools and stuff to help you to get it but it's still the same programming problem of I still have to go through and do every single step all by myself just to get this code running so I can just innovate <laughs> I just want to innovate and I can't it's so frustrating um, But this is something with with virtual HTML that could be solved because if you have everything in one unified code base or in one unified sort of at least general way of communicating, then um, then that wouldn't have been a technical hurdle for me at all to accomplish because all I would have had to do is say, okay, I want to work on the Chrome debugger code and I download the code and then I I modify it and then I click run and then it just works. It's all figured out and it's all in one cohesive unified code that can run anywhere. precedent for this in the past so like um, in um, command line computing and computing on the terminal and, and Linux um, that type of thing you have um, uh, All of the commands ultimately at the end of the day work in text right their, their input and output is always text like you um, you take uh, say a cat a file and that output to the it's going to be output to the screen by default but I could pipe that to another application and then that is going to take that text input and then that application does something with it but then it also produces a text output and in this way you're you can have the different commands which were never programmed to work with each other work with each other because they they just know to deal with text and everyone knows to put the text in generally the same format so that everyone can understand it um, And this is something we need to be maintaining the computing um, to make sure everything is interoperable. Um,
and something we can do with with HTML. We can say, well, HTML that is the new um, that that's the new text that we use. That's the universal way to represent inform information, and therefore any piece of software can then look at HTML and then do what it needs to do to operate on it. Um, Now, this doesn't mean that we have to write everything in HTML because you just need like a bridge layer to just be able to use something in HTML. So like we see with um, virtual desktop computing, um, the technology for doing that, it, you have your virtual desktop somewhere in the cloud and then in my web browser I'm able to access it and control this computer but the actual interface I'm using to interact with it is an HTML it's, it's sending me like the images from the um, the screen from the screen of the virtual machine on the web server and then it's sending my clicks on the page but it's still delivering it to me in, H in HTML even though on the server we're running the old legacy Windows and some other application. Um, and so it, it's possible to create these bridge layers to make it possible to use other software in this HTML context. Um, And so that's another challenge with this is um, organize the software into the different types of software that it is um, so that you can better uh, program it to interact with each other. So. You have different classifications of software. So one would be translator, um, or a um, encoder, decoder, reencoder. These are all sort of in one one class of software. Then you have um, another class of software um, like content editors um, like the Microsoft Word the content editor or the canvas and Photoshop you can paint on um, uh, you have other Classification like simulation, where you have things like unit testing, um, simulation is very interesting because you have things like unit testing, but then you'll also end up writing code. Maybe the purpose of your code is to run a simulation. Or you might write code to simulate some interaction with your with your software, maybe like a one-off unit test type thing. Um, You have all these different classifications of software, and uh, 
and then you have them organized. in this one cohesive, united manner. The neural networks is another one, right? Uh, then you can... Uh, then just make software development so much easier because you don't have to always go and reinvent the wheel every time. You don't have to think about model view controllers again and think about databases because they don't just stuff like with the percolation model you know it just creates the tables as needed and you can just do that behind the scenes and you um, don't need super amount of knowledge about how to train a neural network or or do any of this stuff or that you have to maybe use one that's pre-trained by someone else it's just all there available for you so you can just um okay well i just want to use a language model to detect the, the language that they're using here i want to use i just want to uh, train my own custom model on data that's input through whatever and it can just it's just all there and just super easy to connect and snap together just like back in the days of, on the terminal and snapping together the different uh, the different terminal applications um, these are interface elements you have So many different ways to part everything out. Yeah. Okay, so what does this look like from a consumer point of view? I've gone into some of the the technical details about what it is and how to make it. So what would it look like from a consumer point of view? So I would have a web browser downloaded, a virtual HTML web browser, and as I'm browsing through the internet, now any web page that I visit instantly has the full-fledged web app features that you would expect in the most advanced web app on the web. So, what does that mean? Well, I can modify the page how I want. I can, um, I can invite people to view the page with me and say maybe we have a game in HTML um, I can invite multiple people and we all be playing on the same game even though the game was never programmed to be multiplayer uh, because it's in HTML uh, you get basically all of computer science for free so <laughs> so I see a page I like I want to 
copy it and make it better. I can do that. I just I already have my own local copy. That the version that I'm working on is mine, only mine. I can modify it in any way I wish. And then from now on, whenever I go to to that application, it's uh, it works the way I've modified it to be, and it can still get updates as needed from the web server because it's able to abstract out the HTML changes that I've made versus the, the HTML changes that the um, the web server has made, and it can just manage all of that for me. Um, and so I can not only do that for myself, I can do that for other people. So I make a modification to some page, I can uh, publish it, and the, the original author of that page, they can update the change and take it on themselves, or they can uh, refuse it and not make it public, but there could still be seen that there's this modification there that you could use. And so, yeah, it's just able to make anything that comes across into this virtual HTML document, which it can then just uh. How do you take a system like this and then transform it into an artificial intelligence system that can generally do anything? So, First, you have everything represented in HTML. And you have everyone using the software going about their their daily computations and in doing this you can train a larger model on um, how software is strung together and used in different contexts and in different computations. And So, what this would be. 
likely to look like is a, is a web application. And this web application you could use to 